Evolutionary biology has been like the focus of philosophy of biology since the early 70s. Uh, a lot of it was kicked off by Richard Dawkins' book, The Selfish Gene. Uh, Dawkins made a number of philosophical claims in that, not the least being that um, what really counts in evolution are the genes, not the organisms, and that set off a, an ongoing debate which is still ongoing. Um, philosophy of evolution often gets itself tied up in some fairly technical areas like what is a gene, um, what is fitness, what is selection, um, to a lesser extent things like what are species. Um, one of the big areas that it's currently talking about is uh, it actually goes by the name of evolutionary psychology. Uh, as you may know, back in the 70s, there was a proposal called sociobiology, where the behavior of uh, animals was regarded as an evolutionary question. You could talk about why it is that uh, um, eland have stamping grounds when they mate, why it is that uh, bees are composed of females and drones, uh, all these sorts of questions, and there were evolutionary explanations given for it, which was fine. Uh, a lot of animal behavior was treated as the outcome of evolution, but um, Ed Wilson, E.O. Wilson, who came up with this idea, also had a chapter on human beings and how human behavior was the result of evolution, and that caused a real stink. Uh, more recently, evolutionary psychology has been an attempt to explain how people's behavior is the result of evolution and there's been a lot of criticism of this because typically these views are highly selectionist that is they expect that everything that we do is the outcome of natural selection even when there's no real evidence for it I've seen papers on why women shop and men hunt um, I've seen papers on why men will always rape uh, you know, because it increases their fitness and all this sort of stuff. And a lot of it's quite silly. And not to be, um, not to put too fine a point on it, uh, basically it's often very sexist, very culturally relative, um, very um, um, racist and so on. And these sorts of explanations, they even go back long before Darwin, you know, uh, Negroes, as they were called then, were thought to be less evolved than Europeans. And so you could explain their not being the dominant race and all the system. Um, so there's a lot of debate about this and what sorts of explanations are required. For example, um, it seems to me pretty obvious that a lot of what we do is the outcome of evolution and even the outcome of natural selection. But we don't know what. And it's very hard to test evolutionary scenarios so, and very easy to come up with them. So um, there's an extensive um, discussion, dispute, sometimes all in brawl, about which aspects of human behavior we can assign to evolution, which aspects we can't. Now, there's a couple of issues here. One is not all evolution and possibly not even much evolution is the end result of natural selection. Um, the other question is um, to what extent can we um, identify things as biological as opposed to uh, cultural? In other words, which bits are nature and which, bit, which bits are nurture? Now why this is a problematic question can best be explained by a very famous goat. A goat was born in the 1950s without four limbs. So it only had two legs, right? And rather than kill it, the owner let it live. This goat learned how to sit up and then kangaroo hop on its hind legs. And its entire skeletal structure changed from the normal goat structure. And this turns out to be a function of development, not of genes. Right? Organisms grow in particular ways 
when they are used in a particular environment. Um, human beings will get calluses if they work with tools, but they won't if they don't. So um, some of the explanations about what human beings do being evolutionary seems to me fundamentally misplaced because the assumption is that women will always gather the food. Well, that's a very cultural thing. Right? And we don't know if that's always been the case. Uh, men will always be, uh, you know, dominant in a society. Well, again, how do you know this, right? Um, is the thing that you're trying to explain something of your own invention because you happen to be a male researcher in a uh, pat you know, uh, paternalistic society or, you know, patriarchy? And these sorts of questions are often not asked by scientists. So philosophers of science ask these questions and I think stress test a lot of the ideas and arguments that the scientists are putting forward. So it's, it's of great value to the science that the philosophers ask these questions. Uh, I mentioned development before. Uh, recently, in the last 25 years or so, there's been a rediscovery of the role of development in um, evolutionary biology. For a long time, development was just a black box. Fed your genes into the black box and you got a mature adult organism out the other end and that was what you explained and everything was nice and neat and simple. But development, I mean, we all develop from a uh, single-celled um, zygote through to an organism in stages. And how we develop depends very much on what we're fed, what the environment is like, what our social structure is like. Um, <clears throat> do we live in a family or not? Um, do we live in an extended family or not? What sorts of food is available in your environment? What sorts of weather, etc. And <clears throat> the um, developmental aspects of being an organism had been overlooked for about 100 years. So recently, uh, people started to pay attention to this and the field came to be known as EVO-DEVO, or Evolutionary Developmental Biology. And until um, quite recently, this was not an elaborated field of research. Um, I think it's uh, EVO-DEVO is more about the perspective that you take when you're looking at things um, than it is a different field of research or anything of that kind. It's still evolutionary biology, it's just that now we're paying attention to how organisms actually develop. And developmental biology has um, become absolutely crucial. I mean, we decoded the human genome, we still don't know what most of it does. But we do know that some of it only works at certain points in certain ways in the development of a human being. And we know that when things go wrong in that, you get some diseases. So. Um, we're starting to bring development back into the picture that we're developing of, of how things evolve, how things grow, what things are. And I think that um, uh, the attempts to explain behaviour of animals, and in particular the human animal, in terms of evolution, has gotten a lot more sophisticated and a lot more interesting. And I hope a lot more reliable and, and factual. And a lot less to do with what the dispositions of some tweed-wearing, pipe-smoking American in 1950s uh, Ivy League uh, find important, if you know what I mean. So, my, my views about a lot of the evolutionary psychology that I've read, particularly the stuff coming out of, I think it's, uh, it's not San Diego, it's, anyway, uh, one of the universities of California, I forget which one. Um, a lot of it strikes me as very amateurish, very um, simplistic, just bad research. I mean, it's just bad science, I think, a lot of it. But we're starting to get stuff that's more subtle and elaborate and there's more care taken in setting up the research questions. And I've never doubted for a second that we will give evolutionary explanations of our dispositions to behave. I just don't think you can give an evolutionary explanation of the behavior. For instance, I'm wearing glasses, they slide down my nose, I do this, that's the behavior. 
What's the evolutionary explanation of that? Well, there is none, right? I don't like my glasses sliding down my nose, right? But a disposition to want to see things clearly, right, that's got an evolutionary explanation. And the fact that that involves me keeping my glasses up at the bridge of my nose means that I haven't explained the behaviour, but I've explained the disposition. And I think as evolutionary psychology and um, what have you gets more and more sophisticated in the questions that they're asking, such that they ask questions about things that can have evolved, we'll get some interesting answers. Uh, I think there's a whole field of uh, psychology devoted to cognitive bias that would really benefit from an evolutionary account. If people could start to ask, why is it that, for example, human beings are absolutely useless at setting the base rate of things that stand out? So, oh, I've seen a yellow taxi and I nearly got run over. I saw another yellow taxi and I nearly got run over. Yellow taxis caused me to nearly get run over. That's the sort of argument that people make all the time. But if all the taxis are yellow and there's lots of taxis in your area, then the times you get run over are likely to be near a yellow taxi. Right? So there's no correlation. We are lousy at that sort of base rate reasoning. We just can't seem to set up the kind of probabilities and, and, and uh, frequencies in our environment in ways that lead us to make right uh, uh, inferences to, to reason correctly. And I think there's a probably a very good evolutionary explanation for that. Because the things that we are hardwired by evolution to notice, like yellow cats that are big and stripy, right? Um, those things are rare in the environment. There aren't a lot of apex predators. So we notice stuff like that. And it turns out that in another environment, this leads us to a cognitive bias. So I'd like to see a lot of work done on that. And I think when evolutionary psychology starts paying attention to the rest of psychology in a serious fashion, we're going to get some really good results. Well, I'm a great fan of uh, Kahneman and Tversky. Um, although I think there is a, a tendency people have to take the type two, type one reasoning a little bit too literally. Uh, and go looking for type 1 systems in the brain and type 2 systems in the brain. You know, um, but the thing is that it's, it's cheap and easy to come up with evolutionary scenarios for things. It's absolutely incredibly difficult to actually test for these. In large part because, hey, this stuff happened 50, 100, 150, 200,000 years ago or more. Some of the things that we're talking about are primate uh, shared cognitive biases and that puts it back um, most likely 50 million years ago. So we're talking, you know, about stuff that we just can't directly investigate. Um, and since it is so easy to come up with an evolutionary scenario, uh, I think a lot of scientists have quite rightly said, this isn't worth our while getting into in a big way. We know it must have evolved. We possibly will never know how or why. But uh, it's not counsel despair. There's a lot of stuff we can do and we do do. And I think that the more we learn about our cognitive biases, the more we will have an idea of how we actually evolved. So it goes the other way. Let's learn about the cognitive biases and then reconstruct our likely uh, evolutionary history. Rather than saying, we already know what our en environment of evolutionary adaptation is back in the Pleistocene, and therefore we can say how things will misbehave today. That's the inference that a lot of evolutionary psychology makes. And we don't know what we were like in the Pleistocene. We've got very little information. We don't know what our social structure was. We don't know what we ate. Sure, it's probably very like modern um, hunter-gatherer or foraging societies, as they're called now. But how do we know that? We don't. Right? It gets back to our stuff about Bayesian inference. 
If you've got the wrong priors, you'll get the wrong probabilities. And when you can't actually go out and get more new data, because it happened back then, you know, it's very easy to find yourself talking arrant nonsense and not realise. But um, if we take the way we are now and add to that the assumption that we haven't changed all that much, at least in 10, 15, 20,000 years since the agrarian revolution, um, or what they call the Neolithic transition, um, it's very likely that we can reverse engineer how we might have lived back then, but not because we can show how we're not being adaptive now. We are adaptive now. This is my point. We individually and as a group evolve and individually adapt to the environment in which we find ourselves. That's what human beings are very good at. We're almost um, unique among the primates in having almost no uh, particular environment that we need to live in. We can live on almost anything. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we're the most widespread and successful of any of the primate species. The possible exception of macaques, who seem to be everywhere. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, I, I don't actually think very highly of most evolutionary psychology as it stands.